Welcome to IT Origins, an interview series from Gestalt IT. Each Thursday, we bring you new and interesting conversations with IT practitioners, entrepreneurs, and experts. I'm your interlocutor, Rich Straffolino. Today, we have the privilege to talk to Ted Dunning, the Chief Application Architect at MapR, board member at the Apache Software Foundation, and an expert in machine learning and big data solutions. Ted, thanks for being on IT Origins. Glad to be here. All right, so let's jump right into it. Uh, what's your IT origin story? How long have you been in the field and kind of how did you get your start? Oh, Lori. Uh, well, it's been a long time. It was the late 60s, actually. I uh, That was when I got to build my first computer. It was a Genelec electronic computer kit that uh, used combinatorial switching to do do the dirty work followed not long after by a relay machine and then by my first microprocessor. So that's a little embarrassing because I think that's probably older than some of your listeners' grandparents. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that sounds uh, pretty, pretty old school. Yeah, but, you know, it was old school, but it's also new school because in the mid-'70s, uh, I joined a group that, oddly enough, still in – in a vague form, still exists called the 6502 Special Interest Group in, in in Golden, Colorado, and that really was when I got my first taste of open source. And what it was is I saw how people who shared code, and that was all on floppies back then, uh, if even that, how the people who shared their code really did better out of it than the people who sold their code. This was the beginning of the microcomputer revolution. And uh, people using and people commenting and peeping, people helping you improve your code really was a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and kind of with, with that perspective, um, what would you say has been the biggest change in IT since you've started your career? Because, I mean, we're still very much in, uh, you know, an atmosphere where open source is, is not just, you know, um, do doesn't just exist. It, it's vital to, you know, so many, so many projects, so many companies even. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's been a long road. Uh, for one thing, we have computers now as opposed to just rocks because that was before dirt was invented. But I, I often joke that computer science was a theoretical discipline pretty much until roughly the year 2000 because the computers were just so in, incapable. They were really, really tiny. And most of our time was spent in working around limitations. So that's one massive change is how computers have become much more viable as as something that you can really do interesting things. The other interesting thing is that we've kind of come open circle or full circle. Way, way long ago, people shared software because it seemed like a pretty natural thing to do. And even when the software was heavily encumbered by licenses, people still shared it. It wasn't conceivable, really, that you wouldn't share the code and and work with folks. It was only a bit later that the idea that tying up uh, software as a proprietary element was a dominant form of business. And it came pretty naturally because people had thought of tying up hardware designs as proprietary for a long time. And then when the value shifted much more onto the software side, they just followed along the same sort of thing and they quit sharing source codes. The the DEC users group, the IBM users groups, and, and things like that had access to far less software. But the seeds were set, obviously. And by the, by the 80s, um, the open source movement, as such as it was, we didn't have words for it, but the idea that you could share stuff really began to make a resurgence. And by now, it's recognized as co-equal forms of how to do software or you can do it for money because you have some essence that really is worth it or you can share your efforts if there isn't really a defensible advantage 
and having both models is is a huge a huge step and i think uh, a very interesting one and that paralleled my own understanding i remember trying to license stuff when i was an academic that i wanted to share it widely uh, but i wanted it not to be commercially exploited and so i put a a, a no commercial exploit license on some stuff but then i realized that that was really hampering the value that i was getting out of the software and i wasn't willing to fight for uh, a a better treatment which told me that i didn't care enough to put that kind of restriction on things and so i started putting stuff in the open source well in the open public domain actually even oh, wow. more open than most open source because it felt more like the right thing to do. Yeah, that, that's always interesting to me is the implications of even in the open source community, you know, what license you put on it, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a, you know, a, a BSD license or an Apache software license uh, or, or, you know, uh, something, you know, a, a GNU license or something like that. I, I, I'm always interested in the implications that that has, not just for, you know, the business end of it or, or how it is, it, it's more interesting on how it is used by the community itself and, and the impacts that that has. Well, and to me, you, you really have to think through um, whether you're putting restrictions on things just to be jealous or if there's a viable reason to put those restrictions on there. I mean, you may well have significant intellectual property that you've put into the building of that. And and that's quite a reasonable reason to stick a, a restrictive license on that. On the other hand, if somebody could replicate what you have, that there really isn't a defensible aspect, or if somebody who has a better product or more recognized or used product is ahead of you in the market, then sharing may well be a better strategy for you. And that was what I came to understand is that if somebody else made a million dollars off of software that I wrote and I'd given away, I really wasn't any worse off because I wasn't going to do the work that they would have to do in order to make the million dollars. So it wasn't like they were taking it from me. And in fact, if I was charitable and generous, it was more likely to get something significant back from that software out of the other person's work. That their work, if I were generous, they would probably give me credit back anyway. And so I would wind up with some fraction of that million dollars at some point, either due to notoriety or fame or or straight cash back. Or, or even, you know, I, I would think having expertise in, you know, being the person that initially developed it and, you know, having having that deep knowledge of it. I mean, I, I also think that could be valuable if it's something really blew up and, and really took off as well. Yeah, you, you wind up as a pioneer. And you often also wind up with somebody pointing out how you were less clever than you thought you were, <laughs> how you could improve the software you have. And I've got so many examples of where I was utterly brilliant until somebody showed me I really wasn't. And that, that's, that's been to my great benefit. The, the, and the other thing about it is, like, there was a piece of software I wrote many, many years ago, and there was an article I wrote about a statistical technique, and I aggressively gave away multiple implementations of that software, which was tied to that article. And that led to that technique aside from its innate qualities, which, you know, are quite good. But that giving stuff away wound up making that technique the absolute standard for certain kinds of linguistic or recommendation type technologies. And that resulted in that paper being cited an enormous number of times, I mean, over 2,000 times, which then led to other things which were quite valuable to me, at least a million dollars, actually because of the five or six startups I've been involved in having done pretty well and largely based on that original idea as improved by people who helped me out as a result of my sharing it. 
And can you think of a specific year or or time when the idea of the open source community as as a community kind of um you know kind of, kind of presented itself to you but when it, when it went from just being you know a collection of people to to being a greater community is 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 that are you able to pinpoint that no i really can't because um even when it was a collection of uh of people you know we would meet on tuesday evenings and hang out in the parking lot after uh going for uh for goodies afterwards that was pretty strong community there. People helped each other out in non-computing ways and very much in computing ways. It was a community. We didn't say, oh, we are a community, but we did say we were the 6502 group. And so the community was a pretty much a reality, even way, way, way back. Now, obviously, we weren't an online community because there was no online to be. <laughs> uh, and... The use of community as a an important aspect of it, I think, comes out in the late '90s with the Cathedral and the Bazaar, Bazaar and the Cathedral book, uh, and in the way that the Apache originally software group and then Apache Software Foundation started trying to think about things about how the right role is to build community. And I think that a lot of the modern nomenclature came out of that sort of discussion. But I don't think that the essence, the, the communal commun communality of it started then. I think that that was recognition and applying terminology to something that clearly did exist. So shifting gears, what would you say right now is the worst trend in IT? Well, the the worst trend is probably the same as it always has been, which is to overhype something new just because it's something new and you think it's revolutionary because you haven't ever seen anything like that before. But frankly, you know, in 40 years, the same people who are hyping this stuff now are going to be complaining about overhyping of something else <laughs> then. So today, though, is that blockchain? Is it AI? Uh, you know, kind of, kind of. What is that? What do you feel is that hype right now? Absolutely, both of those. And uh, AI has actually been through these hype cycles multiple times before. And so the standard art, the standard nomenclature in the community had come to be that AI, artificial intelligence, was always used to refer to the stuff that didn't work yet. <laughs> and that as things were made to work, like expert systems or machine learning or gradient descent or neural nets, they were given much more prosaic names, like logistic regression. And that is how they were applied and how people actually built products or built real technologies around them. And the term artificial intelligence continued to be used for the fairyland over the horizon aspects of the field. So it, it's kind of the joke on all these people hyping it to use that term. They're, it's a little bit like they're saying, oh, 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 I love this fairyland technology. Yeah, it, it well, especially, you know, kind of looking at it from a industrial or, or enterprise application, that's kind of our focus at Gestalt IT. I was uh, talking to uh, Dr. Rachel Trailer about this, and, you know, she said it curiously, like if you ask someone for a definition of AI in any of those use cases, uh, there, there's uh, curiously little uh, answer to that question. Well, there's a very, very good answer from a long, long well, time ago. <laughs> yes, and and nothing that you know we're seeing right now comes. You know, it's it's usually based on predictive algorithms and and using kind of feedback to you know to improve selection or something like that. Uh, not necessarily you know anything that would meet a more rigorous definition. I think. Well, but you see, that's the other side of this uh, usage of terminology, is that part of the problem has been that each time people solve one part of the problem of intelligence, solve a problem that just 
a short time before had been defined as we couldn't do this without intelligence. Then somebody solves it or so, builds some system that solves it. And people go, oh, that's disappointing. I mean, that's not magical at all. <laughs> that looks like just engineering or, or just mathematics or just whatever. And that means that these the, the, there's a kind of a disappointment when you get there. Is that all there is? And it doesn't mean, though, that these solutions are not extraordinary, that the capabilities that you've built are not amazing, that the products that make use of them cannot be exceedingly valuable. I am noticeably better off because of AI in the mid-90s. And that was HNC software in the first credit card fraud detection using neural networks. And I was part of the, the internet spin out of that company. They bought us back. Uh, the stock went way through the roof because it was a, uh, an internet startup-ish thing that had real value. And so there is a lot of value there in that fraud protection. And there's been a lot of progress there. There's been a lot of progress in image recognition. A very significant part of the Indian economy would not exist without AI right now. And that's because the Aadhaar Project, the Universal Identity Authority of India, would not exist without the pattern matching skills of biometrics companies. Oh, that's really interesting. I had never thought of it like that. So, you know, six to 10 years ago, 30% of the Indian population had no legal identity. They could only transact with a few dozen people who knew them specifically. They could not have a bank account. And now essentially everybody in India has an identity, has the ability to transact legal transactions, can own property recognized by the state, and they have a bank account because the government opened a bank account for everybody. And that's essentially because of what would have at one time been called AI, but which is now engineering practice called biometrics. That's really interesting. So it, it kind of in that light, where do you see, uh, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, peg this to just AI, but, you know, kind of where do you see the the machine learning landscape and, uh, you know, the, the current hype around uh, big data going in the next uh, three to five years? I mean, what, what, what will become blasé that is revolutionary now? Well, all of the speech recognition and the image recognition stuff is already headed toward boring. Uh, and and therefore real value. It's only when these things get really boring and well enough promulgated among a bunch of different people that uh, that they actually have real value. So that's happening. There is a ton of decisioning that now that transfer learning, that now that you can learn unsupervised and then a little bit of supervised, is possible. People are beginning to be able to build models where the lack of labeled training data meant that they just couldn't do that. Uh, because of what you might call the oversampling of a lot of physical systems, meaning once upon a time, people would put in the bare minimum of sensors that they could make use of because sensors are moderately expensive. They become much cheaper. Uh, that direct sensing was the only viable way to do this, whereas now a lot of indirect sensing is just fine uh, because you can do uh, extrapolated hidden variable sort of techniques. And oversampling is now just fine because we can store the data and process it and make sense of it. So suddenly these estimation techniques, these learning techniques, are becoming much, much more viable because of the enormous amount of unlabeled data. And then kind of like just picking the lock at the last moment, you can add a little bit of labeled data or even inferentially labeled data, and you can build a very interesting 
inferential based machine, decision making machine that makes decisions about physical systems. So that's going to happen. That's already happening. We have customers doing that. I, I can't talk much about what they've told me, but they're doing some pretty damned exciting stuff with physical things. So I think there's going to be a lot in those two areas. The interface with humans, which is obviously becoming vastly more naturalistic, and the interface with the world, which is becoming much more viable. Yeah, to your point, I remember uh, when I think it was Google launched their automated 411 service. Uh, I mean, back in like the early 2000s or something like that. And that seemed like magic. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, now it's, you know, the, the most boring thing to dictate a text message or, or whatnot. And, uh, and you, you know, you kind of, the expectation is it has to work flawlessly. Otherwise, you know, it's got, so it's a very interesting perspective. Would you say, would you say, uh, you know, looking forward to those two things, how is that related to the best trend that you're seeing right now in IT? One of the best trends that I see in IT is uh, a breakdown of some of the encapsulization of various disciplines. People talk about these, these trends of DevOps, which involve, in many cases, embedding one of the data scientists out of a data science group in a, uh, an otherwise non-data science group that have a functional goal. And what happens there is the team takes on the goal, and it isn't a well, I gave you the model, deal with it sort of situation. And that was definitely something that I've worked against when I was managing analysts. And the ops team is there as well. So the developers don't tend to throw something over the fence and say, tough, just make it work. And the ops team can't come back with the bastard operator from hell attitude because they're part of the team. And, and the goal is success, not I did my job. And I hate that I did my job attitude. And so I really, really think that one of the highest trends is this integration of goals between teams, part, sometimes by cross-cutting the teams, sometimes by other techniques. But this idea that people actually have success in mind and so you can have different kinds of technical expertise working together to make that happen. I think it's one of the highest things. All right. And shifting gears a little bit, uh, do you have any book recommendations for the IT uh, practitioners out there? And what are you reading right now? I'm not reading anything right now because I'm busy writing something. Uh, oh, what is uh, that? Ellen Friedman and I are working on what is it, the ninth book we've done together, the tenth one she's done lately, uh, which are these short books that we're doing with O'Reilly, where we pick important uh, trends or changes, things that have become practical and simple enough for folks. We did several on practical machine learning or uh, back when Hadoop was the really big thing, real world Hadoop. Uh, on just a variety of topics, streaming architecture, geo-distributed data, uh, the rendezvous architecture for machine learning in production. And this one is going to be very much about the pragmatics, and we're trying to make it be a very practical book. But of course, taking things into production is, if you do it well, it is making things as boring as possible. You do not want excitement around systems that are in production. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So figure out how to make this a more exciting book than just eat your broccoli and wash your teeth sort of advice. There's going to be some fun surprises in it. And do you know when that'll be out? Uh, it had better be out by Strata this fall. <laughs> That's well, why we're going mad writing it. Well, we'll definitely have to link to uh, some of the previous work uh, in our show notes uh, for people to check out if uh, they are so inclined. Very cool. Yeah, one of the, the most popular is the Streaming Architecture book, and I believe it's available on the MapR website for free. Excellent. Uh, we'll have a link to that uh, definitely in the post. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. 
All right, and uh, first computer you ever owned. I think we maybe have alluded to that uh, at the beginning of the interview, but uh, yeah, uh, first computer. But I think that the first computer that actually computed on its own, that was a stored program computer, Yes, was uh, Jolt 65. It was an early 6502 uh, single board computer. Wow, it's it's not often uh, I am caught totally flat footed. I have never heard of the Jolt sixty five. Well, I just checked the other day, and you can still get the manual for it. <laughs> well, actually, I checked just the other month, and stunningly enough, the sixty five hundred two is still being made. What? What? Uh, for what kind of? I mean, for legacy applications or or. What I, I can't even imagine. I guess it's like the Z80 is still, someone is still making that somewhere, right? Well, I don't know if it is or not, but uh, the 6502 is a fine microcontroller. And uh, the most common new design use of it is, uh, you know, the original one was 3,000 transistors. So you can get an, uh, a VDHL, VHDL core you know, basically the logic design of 6502 that's really tiny. So you can build a computer into your system with very, very few gates. But people are also selling CMOS, very high-speed implementations of it for industrial control sorts of applications. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's I, I never would have yeah think thought of that. Just a, such a simple uh, you know simple microcontroller would uh, yeah definitely have some uses. Yeah, it's if nothing else, it could be a, a logic panel uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, that started when I was in I think Pioneer Electronics, one of the last classic electronics shops in uh, Silicon Valley, and I saw that they actually had on the wall that they're you know, they had a price for a 6502. And I said, said you know, what is that? And they, they said, oh, well, that's one of the classics. It's, it's actually a vintage 6502. I think it's probably the not one of the Commodore ones but or, or the, the MOS technology ones, but the later ones. But then I, I looked it up on, online, and I found that the company in Arizona actually makes them. Stunning. Crazy. What are you doing when you're not working at MAPR and in the Apache Software Foundation? You could hear laughter in the background. That is <laughs> derisive and disrespectful, of course. Uh, the The implication is, of course, that I'm always working for those two things. And it's not really true. I do find some time for other fun things. Uh, we just spent uh, a couple hours in the botanical garden here in Edinburgh today. And I've also been working for the last couple of years on a new technique for estimating percentiles called the T-Digest. And so I've been working to try to make it more accurate than it is and faster than it is and simpler to explain than it is. Did you please pick up the other? Uh, I, I got to sit into a session in a, in a pub. Uh, they, they were so kind to let me try to play the banjo, which sadly I've never played before, so it didn't work as well as I had hoped. Uh, <laughs> I can I imagine. Play through a song. Yeah, Ellen points out that they're not as good at, at tea digest. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's uh, you know if put them in your shoes and uh, yeah, your banjo playing all of a sudden seems a lot better. Uh, no, <laughs> <It probably wouldn't. laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> all right, and Ted, how do you caffeine if you do? Ah, uh, well, I never drink coffee, never have. Uh, it might be good, I wouldn't know, um, but I drink tea. And uh, it depends on time of day and, and mood. In the mornings, we usually have English tea with milk. Um, I'm partial to Thai foo, puts the tea in Britain. Uh, but um, in the afternoons, we commonly have Chinese teas of some sort. Uh, very often, these oolongs, which are just wonderful things. And partly it's wonderful because you can have something that is the best beverage in the world of its type, the most expensive there is, and it's about 50 cents per cup. <laughs> that, that's uh, pretty remarkable. Now, are these, is this a loose leaf uh, situation? Yeah, yeah. It, it, oolong is very easy to brew. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about brewing it too long. So 
and then you can brew it over and over and over again. Uh, a good oolong, you can uh, brew the same pot 10 times. Uh, the, you can go crazy, and they have these little tiny pots that are uh, you, you brew over and over again. Or you can just use a paper cup. That's what I often do. And cover the bottom of it with a good oolong and pour medium hot water, about 90 degrees in there, 90 degrees centigrade, and uh, make some lovely tea. And then pour it again and make some more and pour it again and make some more. And um, it just makes things interesting and you get to focus really well. It's not a, a buzz and it's not shaky. It's just good for work. All right, and Ted, who would you like to see answer the IT origins questions? You know, there's some people who have had an enormous impact on the world, but I think people always think about their most prominent work. And so Vince Cerf was one of the guys who invented TCP, but what did he do before that? Or John Osterhout, who uh, developed Tickle, but also developed a whole lot of architectural patterns like the log structured merge sorts of things um, and advised some really amazing people at Berkeley or John Patterson, who developed and codified a lot of the modern concepts of computer architecture. Those people uh, would be really interesting to hear how they got started. There would be more modern people as well uh, who do just amazing work, and it'd be great to hear their origin stories. All right, and finally, uh, any career advice you'd like to pass on to our listeners? Pause to think. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's a big, hairy question. Yeah, no, well, it is a big, hairy question, and I, I think it deserves a concise answer because I don't think people retain big, long answers. I don't think they mean as much to them. I think that there's two things I would come up with. The first is to decide what you really want, and... The, the two courses of action are that it can be an avocation, not a, a core calling, or it can be a core calling. Computing can be something that really you're fascinated by and you jump into, but you really kind of need to decide which way you want to go just by observing yourself. Is it just work or is it something more than work? I can only advise on the second option. And on that second option, uh, find something you're passionate about in, in the field. Uh, and that isn't always something that you just find. It's also something that you build in yourself. Build that passion. Build something you care about in, in your life there. Take a – give a hoot. Uh, but Ellen actually had a suggestion. Uh, with, with, I'm, I'm so in. She, she's going to barge in over here. She has a lot of input on these things, and she always has uh, very interesting thoughts. So, yeah, so this is Ellen Friedman, my often co-author, and and uh, she said that she, she was sitting there uh, eavesdropping, uh, and she, she goes, wait, 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 I have an opinion about that. Okay. So what advice, Ellen, would you... Uh Hi, I apologize for barging. I happened to walk into the room uh, late on in this uh, in this interview, and that was my laughter bursting in when you asked Ted what else he does. <laughs> um, no, I'd I love to hear it. So my this uh, uh, a much more abstract uh, comment, I guess, uh, with regard to career advice. But for me, there are two ideas. One is there are a lot of people trying to change careers or change their skills right now. And, and some of them, I think, feel daunted by this, especially if they're you know, further along in their career and mid-course in a, in, a, in a career and they feel like they need to make changes. And I think it's important to keep in mind, this is kind of a, a rare moment, but that is a big thing to do. But honestly, the entire industry of working with data is undergoing a, a career change right now. There's a big shift going on. And so they're not the only ones. There are a lot of people making you know, changes in how they're doing business as well as 
as their own personal career. So I think it, it's good to see it also as a great opportunity. And the other advice I would give is it is useful for people to pick up, you know, specific skills or working with particular tools, particular technologies. But I think it's important also to look kind of underneath that of what are the driving principles that make those tools or technologies useful right now, because those will always change. But if you look at why they matter, you're well positioned to keep, you know, changing and evolving as, as things are moving forward and they are changing very quickly. So I think those are the people who do the best because it makes them, you know, agile as well as the, the software process that they're, they're going through. So those are my two ideas. I think Ellen's ideas are probably better than mine in, in a lot of respects. Uh, and in particular, uh, our two situations um, illustrate them quite well. Ellen's actually a biochemist. She's a real scientist. Uh, she hasn't worked in that field for some time. Uh, lately, for the last several years, she's been working in computing, largely in the area of trying to help people understand the trends that are happening right now. But of course, she she according to traditional measures, her background is deficient. And the, the dirty secret is that everybody's background is deficient because nobody has seen the world as it is. That's what she's saying, that the entire industry is undergoing a career change. The only division that makes any sense there is some people realize it and some people don't. The ones who don't are going to be out of date soon. The ones who do realize they're undergoing a career change are the ones who are making that change, taking, grasping the nettle and going with it. So Ellen has made a huge change from working on real things and the actual truth of nature to computing. She doesn't hesitate to remind me that what I do is not science. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, my own, yeah, my own, yeah, again, this happens all the time. She says something profound. I say it again, and she goes, oh, that's what I meant to say. Uh, that's the way it should have been said. Uh, but anyway, my own background is another illustration of this. Uh, I've been involved in computing a long time. It didn't used to be a long time, but but it suddenly is. And the only reason that I have been able to stay relevant and interested and interesting in this field is because I have always been questioning the foundations. I've always been saying, why, how, what's the point, what's underneath it, what's the real shape, what's the real trend underneath this, and, and the real trend in terms of how we're doing these things. Without that, and without that realization that Nobody has much more than five years of experience in this it, at the front edge of this wave. It would have been gone a long time ago. And I've seen people kind of stop. And they may be okay, they may, but, but they often get bored with what they're doing. They become dissatisfied with it because it isn't interesting to do it for the hundredth time. You may be better than the first time and even better than the 20th time, but it's not fun for a novelty-seeking personality anymore. And so diving deep, like Ellen said, and, and understanding the foundations, the cause of things, and realizing that everybody is an imposter and has changed what they do, that what they were trained to do a while ago is not what they're doing. And yet, if they were clever, what they were learning then is something that's helping them learn now. Those are really, what she said was pretty wise. Now, what I was talking about when I said passion is what motivates you to do those two things. If, if it doesn't drive you forward to, to learn these things, you're not gonna be able to really care about the foundations. You're not gonna care about learning the new stuff and realizing that what you knew before needs to be pretty radically adjusted. So you got to care. And I think that, that that's the mechanism that these things that Ellen said have to be 
based on. Well, Ted, thank you and Ellen so much uh, for that thoughtful response. That's some really great perspective. You know, usually with that question, it's focused around, you know, how to succeed, uh, you know, how to advance. Uh, but, you know, I, I think thinking about, you know, imposter syndrome and, and changing industries is going to be only more increasingly relevant, um, you know, not just across the enterprise, but across any number of industries. And I, I think that's really great advice. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, I hope it's great advice, but somebody might take it. <laughs> then you're really in trouble. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, she says, in that case, it's my fault. It's my advice. Well, before we get you out of here, uh, Ted and Ellen, uh, if you'd like, uh, where can people find you online and anything you'd like to plug before we head out? I can be found online all over the place. Any permutation pretty much of my name at MapArt, you can guess, and it'll be there. My name, Ted.Dunning, at Gmail works. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, and, and the tweets that I tweet are going to make it pretty unmistakable that you found me. Ellen and could be found. There are other people on Twitter, so you're Ted underline Dunning. Yes. There is another Ted Dunning out there. And uh, Ellen I'm could be found. On Twitter, and I'm uh, Ellen, E-L-L-E-N, underscore Friedman, is F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. But you don't need to. Yeah, but the, the, those are two good ways to find either or both of us. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for being part of IT Orange. I think this is our first uh, incidental uh, two-part interview. Um, so this is this is really great, uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Uh, frankly, I think that's the essence of computer science. If you got something to say, say it. And, and it's probably going to be an interesting contribution if you think through what you say. IT Origins is produced by Rich Straffolino and Gestalt IT. For more interviews and IT coverage, head to gestaltit.com.